Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, not too bad. It was we will get started. Um, sure we're just getting started a little bit uh, late today, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so welcome. Uh, this is the last of our speaker series for this year. Um, so, so happy that many of you have come out over the season this year to attend our previous events. And um, we look forward to seeing you again next year. If you have any ideas or suggestions for topics for next year's speaker event, um, or anyone who might be interested in coming and doing a presentation, or just some sort of event that would be great, um, please let us know so that we can try to uh, work on getting some arrangements or trying to see if we can get, come, uh, get some speakers um, and that kind of thing. So open to any ideas you might have. Uh, starting off, a couple of housekeeping things. So as always, uh, if you are looking to use a washroom, they're just down the hall here. Um, refreshments are off to the side. If you have a cell phone with you, if you could please put it on silent or vibrate, uh, that would be appreciated just so it doesn't uh, disrupt our presentation. Um, if you have not already picked up, if you are a member and have not already picked up your Windward, uh, we do have them at the back for you to pick up, so please check in with Brian. Um, if you are not a member and you are here, welcome. And if you would like to receive a copy of the Windward for, from this year, uh, again, we do have copies available at the back for purchase. Uh, or if you're looking for a previous year's um, copy, we also have those available at the back as well. Um, upcoming events. So like I said, this is the last of our speaker series for this year. Uh, the next event we will have is our annual general meeting. It is scheduled for next, sorry, not next Sunday, the Sunday after. That's September the 22nd, starting at 1.30 p.m. We are doing it virtually this year, so uh, it is all online. So if you are not from this area and you would like to attend, we would love to see you. Um, please register with us. There is a sign-up sheet at the back. Um, you can sign in and uh, Sheila, who is our secretary, will send you the details closer to the event. Um, yeah, I think that's it for housekeeping stuff. Yes, sir. May I just one, make one remark? Once Kathy has finished her presentation, if people have questions, could they please wait till the microphone reaches them? Maybe if you raise your hand is so that we know that you'd like to have a question. Do you have a separate one? Got it. Um, that would be great. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to get started. So our speaker for today uh, is Kathy Christie. She is the chair of CASI, which is the Kingston Area Seed System Initiative, um, and a master gardener. Um, she is here with her presentation called Every Seed Has a Story. So uh, talking about heirloom gardening. Um, thank you, Kathy, for making the trip over today. Um, she has a great presentation for us, as well as some samples and stuff so, um, that uh, she will tell you more about. So I'm going to turn things over to Kathy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Um, is this a good place to stand for the recording? Okay, great. <laughs> I'm used to moving around, so if I move around too much, just tell me to stop. Um, so thank you all for being here. It's a beautiful day outside, and it's really nice to see this kind of interest in heirloom seeds. Kathy Rothermel, I didn't see you sneak in. So <laughs> Kathy is one of the founding members of CASI, the Kingston Area Seed System Initiative. So it's no surprise that she is uh, now running and operating Kitchen Table Seed House here on the island. So we are so lucky to have her and Annie doing this work. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being here. And anything you want to add, Kath, just jump in. <laughs> All right, um, so every seed has a story. I'd like to begin with uh, land acknowledgement. And um, so I just want to say thank you, Chi Megwich, Niawa, to the Haudenosaunee, the Ashinaabek, and the Wendat for the generations of caretaking and love that they extend to the land and the waters. I would like to acknowledge the harm of colonial practices to the land and the waters and the original inhabitants of this place. I thank the land, the waters, um, 
everything that lives here, the rocks, the fungi, the bacteria, the birds, the insects, and all the other animals, the photosynthesizers, cyanobacteria, algae, plants, all of these beings know what they need to do in the web of existence, and we can learn what we need to do if we open our hearts and our minds to their teachings. So, thank you. I also like to thank seeds. I just want to remind us what a seed actually is. And uh, this is just a cute little drawing. I know it's a little bit fuzzy with the projection, um, but it's essentially 350 million years ago, the terrestrial plants, they devised a way to keep their babies safe. So what we have is when we look at a seed and I'll just, show off some of the gorgeous bean seeds in our collection. Yeah, just maybe pass them around, Kim. So um, imagine this is a seed coat, and then inside of it, we've got the little tiny baby plant and the food for the plant. And, and that's, that's what we're dealing with. That's what we're protecting. And that's what I'm here to talk about even a, a little bit today. The other thing I promised to talk about what an heirloom variety is. So I like to think of them as the living hand-me-downs from generation to generation. They were ones that were so good, so tasty, that people wanted to keep them, to share them, uh, to save them. And, and this is, we began domesticating plants and they began domesticating us about 10,000 years ago. And um, we've just been in relationship with them since then. And so it's kind of ironic to me that an heirloom, the, the proper definition is it's been saved for at least 50 years. So it's been in somebody's family or a cultural group or a religious group, affiliation, whatever, for at least 50 years. And given we've got this 10,000 year history with the seeds, um, it seems like a short time frame, but here's the official definition. So, and at Cassie, um, we, we also think that they are plants and seeds that are worthy of being saved, which of course all the seeds are, but, um, you know, ones that are helping us to manage the, the current climate crisis. So that's what our focus is. So open pollinated seeds. Um, are people familiar, I'll just do, I I'm usually do a little secret vote of science, but I'll just do it. Are people familiar with what an open pollinated seed is? How many people, a little nod, a little bit. Okay, I'm seeing, I'm going to do a quick refresher. So essentially, an open pollinated seed is one that the pollen comes, you know, from the pollen producing part of the plant and is carried either by wind, by dew, by um, pollinators that we're more familiar with, bees and insects, bats, that kind of thing. And the pollen gets carried over to the pollen accepting part of the plant. And that's how the fruit, um, sorry, the seeds are formed and generally associated with the fruit as well. So, I think of these as the pollen producing flowers and then the fruit producing flowers. And you can see the fruit right here. So this happens in open pollinated seeds without any human intervention. Okay, we, we can intervene, but for the most part, these are varieties that don't need us. There's exceptions to every rule, of course. And so, Open pollinated seeds, they have, as I mentioned, they, you know, many of these plants have been around for millions of years. We've been domesticating them. They've been domesticating us for 10,000 years. And so they're, they've been evolving from a relationship with the soil, the land, the, the environment, and the farmer, the seed grower and saver over time. And so the way you can think about it is their genes have been adapting to changing conditions. And um, so they develop pest resistance uh, through relationship with their environment. And they're also, just as I, you know, the heirlooms that I was describing in the introduction, they're cultivated for taste and because they grow well where, where they grow. So they can adapt themselves. 
And so that's why all of the seeds in the Cassie collection in our Living Seed Commons are open pollinated. And it's, we'll, we'll learn more about the reasons why that is so important. So something, oh, I should just mention, I just learned this. Um, it's really interesting. In the States, seed packets have to be labeled as open pollinated or hybrids or if they have been genetically modified. Um, in Canada, we don't have to. It's not a requirement of the SEED Act, which is, I find, super interesting. But the SEED Act does say that if you do say it's open pollinated, then it has to be open pollinated. Or if it is a hybrid, then it has to be, you know, um, it has to be. So you have to be accurate if you put it on, which is why most seed packets in Canada don't have any indication of what they are, unless you're buying from kitchen table seed house who are proudly open pollinated <laughs> and say so right on their website. So the importance of local seed producers, local growers, I, I think you can get a sense of how important that is just from this description, this gorgeous description of open pollinated seeds that another friend of Kathy's and my developed this, uh, this graphic. All right, so I promised I would talk about um, heirlooms, you know, that uh, maybe your, your favorite vegetables where, um, I'll be honest, I've been searching for much of my life. My Nana always had these amazing beefsteak tomatoes this time of year. And I had the privilege of staying with her quite often. And so almost every meal would be these amazing scarlet beefsteak tomatoes. Either she grew them herself or got them from farmers, uh, our families from the county. And so um, they, would, they would be growing in the county. And that's my childhood and teenage year memory. The irony is, I, I don't know, I'm so sorry my face is so red today, but it's tomatoes make my rosacea flare. And I've been eating a lot of tomatoes because they're so good right now. So I didn't notice till I was on the boat today. I looked up in the mirror and I went, oh my God, you poor people. So I'm so sorry. <laughs> Anyways, thank the tomatoes. Um, so it's really interesting. I have been growing um, tomatoes for Cassie now since 2017 and trying different ones. And, and I'll be honest, um, it wasn't until I found this one, uh, Mennonite Orange. Do people know this one? Have you eaten it? Oh my gosh. Okay, so I'm just processing the seeds right now, I, so I don't have them here to share, but our CD Saturday is in March, or, you know, I'll somehow get them to Shauna. This is honestly the best tomato I've eaten in a very, very long time. And it's so interesting. There's good reasons why a lot of quality, especially older varieties, are associated with Mennonite and Amish communities. And it, it's from their relationship with the land as well. So they have their cultural practices, have an amazing relationship with the land. And because of that, they honor the plants that they grow and save the seeds from. So a lot of um, like Amish paste tomatoes, have people heard of that one? Oh my gosh, that's another really amazing tomato. Bear Root Gardens up in Verona, they offer Amish um, paste tomatoes. Oh, so good. So, so good. So I'm hoping that all of you are kind of now thinking back to um, something that you loved when you were a child or a teenager or, you know, just even last year, whatever. And I want to talk now about where those different, where, where did those different kinds of crops come from? And I find this fact very fascinating. Um, this is a little bit of an old graphic, so I imagine the numbers have changed. Um, when I was preparing for this talk, I would end up going down deep dives on, I'll, I'll tell you a few of my deep dives, but just the, the things that are on the web and then you get into the scientific papers and, and I have a science background, so I'm a geek and I just kind of dive in there and I'm like, whoa, stop it. You don't need this for the talk, back up. But so 250,000 to 300,000 species of plants that can be used for humans for food. You know, obviously they're being used by other um, our other native kin uh, in different ways and having different relationships. Of those, 10 to 50,000 are edible. And then what is particularly frightening is there are, and I'm so sorry this is cut off, 
three species, rice, maize, which is like corn. Um, yeah, it worked fine when I was, no, no, no worries. Um, it, make up 80% of the calories and protein that we derive from plants. So we're already narrowing the diversity of crops that we are relying on. And there's interesting reasons for that that we'll explore today. So um, where do these crops come from? So back at uh, the turn of the century, there was uh, a wonderful scientist from Russia, um, Nikolai Ivanovich Vavilov, and if Marjorie Boosfield was here, she would tell me I'm probably pronouncing this wrong, but with all respect, um, so Vavilov was, at the time, he was cutting edge. Um, so he was an agronomist, he, he was a geneticist, Mendel's genetics that hopefully some of you learned about back in high school were just being rediscovered, and, um, and so Vavilov actually worked with the British scientist who was bringing them back into favor. And he brought those ideas back to Russia. And, um, and luckily, Lenin let him do his thing and go to town. And so he started, he recognized the importance of identifying where different crops came from. So for example, this is where the potatoes. And so as well as having thousands of domesticated varieties available, there's also the wild types, again, the cousins of the domesticated varieties. And so Vavilov's genius, and I just, we're a historical society and I love looking at original documents, so there are some of his original journals. And his genius was realizing that by going back, identifying those centers of origin, finding the wild type cousins, he would be able to take some of the genes from the wild type, from the cousins, and start breeding plants that would help stop famine in the world. That was his goal. And, uh, and he was willing to share his results with the world, which is you know, very interesting given the, the you know, political changes. And this was right at the time of the Russian Revolution. So let him, let him be in charge. And uh, by the time he was done, he's the one who started uh, seed banks, gene banks. And um, by the time he was done, sorry, when he was at the peak of his power, um, influence, not power, influence. Apparently, he was an amazing guy to work with, too. This was another rabbit hole that I went down, you know, interviews with him and, and people who knew him and that kind of thing. So... He went around the world, um, tons of trips. He, he visited like 64 different countries. And by the time he was done, I just want to make sure I've got the right number here. These are the notes I don't, I learned so much about this, this very inspiring person. By the time, at the peak of his power, there were 250,000 seeds in his uh, seed bank in Leningrad, which is now, of course, St. Petersburg. So have people heard about the siege of Leningrad? This is a side note. So during uh, World War II, the, all of these seeds are in the seed bank in Leningrad. People are starving. The Nazis have cut off all of the supplies. And his, the people who were the custodians refused to eat any of those seeds. And um, actually nine of them died mm -hmm. of starvation when they were surrounded by plenty. So it was a 900-day siege of Leningrad. And... Uh, and that was a tribute. They believed in the work that he was doing and, and what he was doing. So um, shout out to him. And some of the research, some of the holes I went down were people trying to show that his centers of origin, which now we call centers of diversity uh, rather than origin, um, weren't, you know, weren't as accurate as they could have been. And the most recent paper that I just read that was 2023 was he got it right. You know, yes, there are some, you know, different different ones we can add to, especially in North America, because he, he didn't, I don't think he made it to North America. Um, anyways, he was pretty bang on. And that's with all the genetic work, you know, the um, polymerase chain reaction stuff that, that people can do these days. So this is geneticists saying 100 years ago, Vavilov was... You know, he, he, did, he did well for his, he did great for his time. So I'm not sure how this projects, but again, just to give you an idea, um, so South America, potatoes and tobacco, 
That's where these crops originated. And then up in Mexico and Central America, again, this is an older graphic, but I liked it because you could kind of get a sense of, of, the, different, of, of the different varieties, the different crops that, and where they started from. And this is also something that I find so interesting is that people started doing agriculture around the same time at different places in the world. You know, and so again, my deep dives into the study, these different studies, it's like, well, okay, potatoes were in the Indies, tomatoes were in Central America and Mexico, kind of at the same time. The most recent one was, oh no, tomatoes arose in um, Ecuador. So, bah. But you get the sense, you know, the general general sense. And then this one's also I thought was cute with all the, the different pictures on it. So this is where the different crops, um, the different things like tomatoes and potatoes and beans, where they all came from. And essentially what happened was they stayed in place until... Um, until uh, you know Columbus arrived and and the different trade routes and and then the the global exchange I mean things were already moving around on the continents and so there are different maps and and I encourage you to go digging around for that because it is it is pretty fascinating um, but it was basically when uh, Europe you know colonized invaded uh, South Central and, and North America that things really started to exchange. And so this, for example, is uh, a map showing how corn, maize, moved around the world. And they've reconstructed it based on um, trade patterns, which is pretty cool as well. And then you can't see very well, but you know the different colors show where um, corn is being grown and uh, where, where it came from. So here's a graphic that shows the evolution of corn, at, sorry, the, the domestication of corn. And so for a long time, scientists could not figure out what the ancestor of corn was. They, it just eluded them. And then finally they linked it to this grain and teosinte and, and did it genetically as well as um, just, again, the center of diversity, center of origin linkages. And so I love this picture. Again, the dates are blah sometimes, but we've got the first corns that are living in, you know, being domesticated by people, domesticating people. Corn actually relies on people. If you don't grow it out and, and let it pollinate, it actually reverts back to its wild ancestors. I, I couldn't find the exact time frame, but I've, I've heard it from enough people that I, I accept that that is the case. So you've got the first corns, and then as I was showing with the, um, the, the trading, so then we start to see different corns, the ones that survived when they moved to different areas in the world, they started to be changed. People started working with them to improve them, maybe make them more nutritious, make them more attractive. Um, and so that's just how things worked. And then things got even more <laughs> heated up when, um, especially in North America, we trusted British seeds for some reason. We really did. And again, because it's a historical society, I just thought I'd show you this. Carter's tested English seeds for all climates. Like, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> so they grew them, give them credit, they grew most of their seed at four farms in Britain. Like, 814 acres of peas. Like, that's a lot of peas, right? So they're shipping them around the world. And yes, things survived. They did. And, and so if they survived, then because it was expensive to buy seeds, it still is expensive to buy seeds, um, then the ones that survived were the ones the seeds got saved and planted again. And so yeah, maybe the claim seeds for all climates, but I would say just barely, <laughs> just barely. And luckily for the settlers who were sending, spending their hard earned money, I mean, we're talking survival, right? My ancestors moving to um, 
Prince Edward County. Like, wow, if you were actually buying seeds, you're spending a lot of money. And uh, yeah. So what happened to the domesticated varieties as they moved around the world? They, they were changed. So I love this diagram because you've got the wild cousin, you know, the wild type is at the top. And what those different colors represent are the different genes that would allow it to survive in different conditions. And so as the different crops, whether it's beans or tomatoes or corn or potatoes, as they were domesticated, you can see you lose some of that genetic variation. And then the current varieties, especially when you get into hybrids and genetically modified um, crops that I'll speak it to in, in a little while, it gets even more concentrated. So we're losing biodiversity. We're losing the genetic variation. Each one of those colors represents a gene that could help us respond to the changing conditions associated with our current climate crisis. So that's how it's going. And, um, and this picture, it's, I hope, can you see it from, from where you are? So this is a century ago. There were, for example, 288 varieties of beets in seed catalogs. 1983, so 80 years later, there's 17. Yeah. So this, this figure is in dispute. You know, the actual numbers, people have called it into question. There's, you know, all kinds of papers and, and things about that. But there is no denying that we are losing biodiversity. The FAO, which is, Kath, help me out, I can never remember, FAO, Federation of Agriculture, the UN. Thank you, that's all it is. Federation of Agriculture Organization. I don't know why I always lose that acronym, but this is a UN body. We have lost 75% of the genetic variation. So, you know, whether this is, you believe all the numbers on this, 75%, is not good, you know? If we're gonna to respond to all of the changing conditions that we've, especially people growing, whether it's seeds or food or anything, you know, we need, we need the genes, we need the resilience. And um, so what happens when we lose genetic variation? Well, we have all kinds of historical case studies that I'll just run through really quickly. Um, the first one is, the, the Irish potato famine. Are people familiar with that? Yeah, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. But basically, we start off with 5,000 varieties that those, you know, the early invaders, explorers, could have taken back to Europe. And they took back one, the lumper, back to Ireland. And then, not surprisingly, um, it also carried along some diseases. That was another paper that I got lost in, how this, um, the, the disease pathogen is a heterotrophic protus, so Phytophthora infestans, um, as well as the, t the potato moving all around the world. It also moved around the world. And, um, and so the devastation that I, it looks like most people are familiar with, certainly some of my family emigrated to North America because of this. Um, it's heart-wrenching, and it can, it's being repeated these days as we rely on these huge stands of monoculture crops. Um, so this is, a, this is the map that shows the, um, the different, the, the blight. I'm just going to call it the blight rather than phytophthora. Um, so there's three different... Um, kinds, sorry, just two different kinds. So the yellow is the one that infested, um, devastated Ireland. And Ireland, like the reason it was so bad there, I, I don't know this, I, I will just do a little bit of the details, but until the potato came to Ireland, people waited till a certain age to get married. Like they actually checked in the census and churches and stuff. And then as soon as people were able to make a living and not die when the potato was introduced. Those marriage ages dropped and they started having babies. 
And so the population exploded, which when um, the blight happened, it was even more devastating than it would have been prior to the potato introduction. So it was, it's, you know, just this whole economy, um, seeds, food, it's all interchangeable. So what I learned from this paper was the blight wasn't just limited to Ireland. Everywhere that's yellow, they went and sampled these scientists. Scientists are a little crazy. I have a scientific background. But anyways, they went and sampled herbariums, potatoes and herbariums, to see if those samples had um, evidence of this blight as well. And so wherever there's yellow, the herbariums had evidence of the blight. And, and it's lasted for 150 years. It, did, it wasn't just, you know, Ireland. So it, when we talk about the seeds moving around the world, the crops moving around the world, we also have to remember that diseases are moving as well. And um, so that's just something to think about. And I'll leave you with the note, 5,000 varieties are available. When we go to the store, how many do we see? We see three, right? Red, white, and if you're lucky, russet. And uh, there's a whole story about the Yukon gold that was actually developed in Canada. I will get into that, but it's, so, um, yeah. <laughs> and I just, I think this, the potatoes are coming. Um, the clones, the clones. Um, so getting back to Vavilov, uh, again, another little case study of where almost a similar thing happened. So he was, Vavilov was fine as long as Lenin was around. You know, he was who appointed him, the 20,000 people. And then, unfortunately, after Lenin died, um, Stalin took over, and unfortunate for all kinds of different reasons. But one of his strategies was to increase efficiency of the economy. And so what he did was he merged all the small farms and, um, and encouraged them to grow just one crop. So again, the monoculture whether it's, you know, the lumper potato or the, or the monoculture. And um, so starvation ensued, unfortunately, because we need biodiversity. We need the different crops that are in the different places, especially Russia. Like it's, you know, it's... Unfortunately, Stalin turned to... Vavilov was uh, from a wealthy, a prosperous family. Um, and, and so, unfortunately, Stalin turned to Lysenko. He was proletariat. Um, he was not as... He was educated differently than Vavilov. Um, many of his so-called theories have been completely discredited these days. So his advice to Stalin, Lysenko's advice to Stalin was, oh, don't worry about that plant breeding stuff. Let's just soak the wheat seeds in, in water and that will make it okay. And um, that didn't help because that wasn't the problem. And so meanwhile, you've got Vavilov who honestly, he really did just want to help the world. He wanted people not to be starving. And uh, so unfortunately, Lysenko was discrediting anybody who was interested in genetics. It was very much frowned upon. Um, people were imprisoned. And eventually, Vavilov was imprisoned in 1940 as a traitor. And uh, he was supposed to be killed. But instead, he was imprisoned, sentenced to death for 20 years. And he died three years later of starvation. And it's just horrible story. So sorry about that. But I just, um, what is so interesting with that collectivization, again, the, the, the idea of monoculture, like right now what we're seeing is monocultures of hybrids, and I'll speak to that in a minute. But when they were doing this collectivization, what you can see here is, I just want to make sure I'm doing this right. So open pollinated from land races. So this is 1941. Um, they're still relying on open pollinated wheat. The hybrids were just were introduced much later. So that mass starvation, that collapse, that happened when with open pollinated seeds as well. So it's it's just something something to think about. All right. So hybrids, um, basically hybrids. We need open pollinated seeds because they're the foundation of our food systems, uh, of, of everything. And so hybrids are created from open pollinated seeds. So Mendel, if you think back to his tall peas and short peas, you would, he would cross them and get like a mid-sized pea. And that would be fine and often very productive. You know, think about um, a donkey 
and a horse and you get a mule, right? So the mule, very important for um, set, settling um, North America, but you couldn't breed two mules to make baby mules. You always needed to have the donkey and the horse. So it's the same idea with hybrids. You can cross them and you will get nice, like people used to breed them just for fun, you know, before video games and stuff. Like it was cool and, and, and super fun. My, my dad and my neighbor, anyways, they always had a competition about whose tulips came up first, you know, that kind of thing. So um, hybrids in, the, in and of themselves are fine, but you have to buy seeds every time. And so that's why, like what happened, we've got the domestication of corn, um, what happened in the 30s here in North America, especially in the United States, is again, just like 5,000 varieties of potatoes, we've got all these different varieties of corn. And in the 30s, because of the Dust Bowl, because of the Depression, people were starving, they started developing these hybrid corns. And again, in and of themselves, you know, it's a, it's a solution, but now they're being replaced. And now it's 96% of the fields in, in uh, the states that grow corn are hybrids. So again, whether it's a hybrid or an open pollinated crop, as long as it's a monoculture, we're in trouble because you're vulnerable, not just to diseases, but to changes in weather, you know, just that rain that just came down two days ago, right? Like you need crops that can, that are resilient enough to stand that. Um, so just wanted to speak to the hybrid varieties. And the other problem is that once you start getting seed companies that want to sell hybrids because they're, gonna, they're very profitable, um, you have to buy the seeds every single time. And then they're also bred to respond to different chemicals. Okay, that, that problem gets exacerbated even more when you get into the genetically modified um, varieties. But so how now we're in the 50s and the war has just finished, thank God. And, and but now these chemical companies need product. They need uh, consumers for their products. And so that's when we see the introduction of herbicides and pesticides and fertilizers that you can't do without, you know, like that's the advertising. We'll get into some, um, some seed catalogs in a few minutes. But that's, that's, um, that's where we were. And then genetically modified seeds arrived. So are people familiar with what a genetically modified I, yeah, just aware of the time. So unfortunately, in 1980, there was a Supreme Court case. It wasn't the first time, but it was a very significant case. It was brought to the Supreme Court. It was about a bacteria. And the bacteria had been genetically modified so that it could break down oil. That was the era. Some of us are old enough to remember the Exxon Valdez tragedy. And, you know, these, these tankers are going across the world with fossil fuels. And, and so this, who wouldn't want a bacteria that breaks down oil? Unfortunately, when it was taken to the Supreme Court, the judges didn't understand that bacteria were actually alive. And so what, what transpired was there had been some, a few living things that had been patented, but this case that the, the, the judges that were against it were so strongly against it, they wrote an opposing um, brief, which it, that, that means they're, they're, they're pissed, right? Like they're angry. And, uh, and then there were five judges that were for it. And I'm so sorry, next time I will do the, the print with, with white. I didn't think it would make that much of a difference. But unfortunately, all of the ones that were against it were appointed by Democrats. By, by Democrats, and all the ones that were for it um, were appointed by Republicans. So we basically got nine men, uh, eight of them are white, who are deciding what happens next. And that's when everything with patents started to just accelerate. I was at Queens at that time. I was working on my PhD. My friends who were working in those labs, like, they were they were patenting things they were working they were it was it was it's a bonanza you know for for these companies and it it comes down to this and 
I've searched high and low. I would love to find a book about this, like who was, who were the influences, who I, and I haven't been able to, so if somebody knows of something, maybe I need to write it, I don't know. It's pretty interesting. So GMO seeds, I feel badly for GMO seeds. Like I, I seriously do. Um, they are, uh, I think the problem is, so I don't want to get too sad about this, but the problem is we've been working with seeds for 10,000 years. And the idea that these chemical companies, there's four multinational chemical companies that are controlling our seeds right now. And they, I think they have the right to enslave these seeds. Like it just, it, I, it just bothers me. So these are, uh, these, are the, these are the players. You'll notice lots of the names we recognize, Monsanto, DuPont. So up until 2013, it was bad. And then in 2018, it got worse. Um, Monsanto wanted to disguise itself by merging with Bayer. Bayer's also got a terrible history with chemicals and, and the war and, yeah, but most people associate it with aspirin, right? Which is good. So, anyway, so this is this is the um, this is the state of seeds right now, and and I have to do a shout out for the National Farmers Union. They are running. If you go on their website, read their Save Our Seeds campaign. They are working so hard to try and keep seeds in the hands of farmers and the hands of you know, growers like you and me. And, and uh, so it's to fight back against this. And yeah, that's my, some people may or may not like this, but I'm just gonna throw it in. How about seed banks? They're gonna save the world. Favilov started them, it's all good, right? Um, so this is um, Feldberg of course, and what happens in Svelberg, if you go, there's actually, you can like visit it and there's a virtual site and you can go and see like where Canadian seeds are and all that kind of, it's very cool. And um, so the seeds there do get replaced every 10 years, but often in seed banks and other places, um, Canada, we also have uh, what we call germplasm, like baby seeds, like the genetic material from the seeds. It's frozen down. But what happens is it's frozen down, it's preserved, yay, but then it's not learning how to respond to the changing conditions. Oh. And so I can't remember what percentage of germplasm in the world is now frozen down. Kath, do you have that? Yeah, it's pretty high. Yeah, so with the Cassie Living Seed Commons and seed companies like Cathy's and Bear Root Gardens, um, Pat and Kate Jocelyn up in Verona, they're growing, we're growing out the seeds so that they're continuing to evolve and to adapt, which is super, super important. Um, so it's good we have them, but they are very vulnerable as we've seen in Ukraine um, to war. Same problem happened in South America. Uh, the potato seed bank back in the 90s was, um, was uh, almost blown up. And interestingly, apparently the reason why the one in Leningrad wasn't blown up, I can't remember why, but there was a meeting or a summit in the hotel across the street from it. And so that's why the allies, or maybe that's why the Germans didn't blow it up. Anyways, there's a story there too. So I can, I'm so sorry. I thought I would remember it as I was saying it. So back to... Oh, okay. That makes sense too. Yeah, yeah, because it's a well-known collection. And that's another reason why there's so many different varieties, like cool varieties that have Russian names. So in our collection, we've got a very rare kale, um, Russian hunger gap kale, which as the name suggests, got people through hunger gaps. And, uh, and it's good, like it's, it's prolific and tasty and I don't like kale and I like this one. So <laughs> anyway, so back to happier stories. Um, so I couldn't resist because you're a historical society. I did a talk about seed catalogs and it was just super fun. I just loved it. And um, so the conglomerations that I was just showing you that are happening internationally, they also happen in Canada. So we did used to have lots of fairly large seed companies. So for example, um, George Keith and Sons was established in 1866 and um, 
and then here are just some of the catalogs I'll just take you through because I just is this just not too adorable for words like and then um, the Rennie Seed Company it was established in 1870 and carried on for uh, 60 years or so they actually grew their seeds in Toronto so what we've got instead of Carter's and other companies like that bringing them from you know elsewhere in the world what we've actually got is local seeds yay which is what we need and um, and then Steel Briggs at Seed and Company it was established in 1873 you will be happy and prosperous by using their seeds. <laughs> so that's, um, and it was, it was big enough business. This is downtown Toronto at um, Spadina. This building still exists. There was a rail line that came up to it because they were supplying the settlers, you know, who were moving out west. And like this was, seeds were big business. And, uh, and it was exciting times. And then, you know, the, the catalogs continued. They, they moved away from hand drawings to photography. And uh, there's some, some of the papers I read just talking about how accurate are the pictures and the descriptors and that kind of thing. But at least there's descriptors. Um, prior to 1863, there were catalogs, but they didn't have great descriptions of the different varieties. And so um, a book that I brought that I signed out of the library William Moise Weaver, who is an expert on heirloom gardeners, he sort of bemoans that you don't know what's what prior to 1863, and even after that, you know, there's some question. Um, but they're they're beautiful. You just you want to buy these seeds, you know. And this is the the age of hybrids are starting to be introduced, and you would pay more for a hybrid seed packet because they had better quality. Like that that was that's the mindset. And so we've got the Canadian tomato. I've searched for this to try and find the Canadian tomato again. I would love to have it in the Cassie Living Seed Commons. Can't find it. So I'll keep digging. But 1928, they're just, they're lovely seed catalogs. And then, of course, there's the consolidation and, and the buyouts. And so sold in the 60s, sold in the 70s, and then in the 80s, Mackenzie is the only national seed packing. And despite the fact that they have often have uh, proudly got ca Canadian flags on many of their packets, it's, they're, they're only packed. So 97% of the seeds you buy in stores and even from catalogs, like uh, companies with catalogs are grown somewhere else in the world and then shipped here. So another reason to grow your own, save your own buy them from Kitchen Table Seed House or Bear Root Gardens in Verona. Like we were so lucky to have two local seed companies. Like I honestly can't, I can't say enough. So I could rant a little bit about Mackenzie Seeds because uh, Mackenzie was actually great. He left it to the government and uh, he wanted it to fund the Agricultural College in Brandon, Manitoba. In their infinite wisdom, the government then sold it. And uh, so now it's, it's even though the, it still has its office in Brandon, Manitoba, but it is owned by other, uh, you know, international, multinational interests. Proudly Canadian, yeah. Anyways, <laughs> so our collection, the roots of the Cassie Living Seed Commons, just really quickly, started right when all of those buyouts were happening. Carol and Robert Mook were um, farming, they were market gardeners, and they couldn't get the seeds for the varieties that they wanted. And so they realized they had to start saving seeds. And um, so they did. And um, they saved the seeds until um, about 1999. And then they asked the Sisters of Providence in Kingston um, if they could house the collection, their collection there. It really is a one-of-a-kind, unique collection. And uh, so until 2008, they worked with the Sisters of Providence on site at Heathcliff. And, um, and then Kate Henderson was brought in after the moves kind of retired and, and moved away. I, I should say in 1999, they, they retired from the farm and moved to Kingston. And so they were, they were growing the seeds at Heathcliff. And, um, and then in 2019, um, the seeds were gifted to us and to our sister organization in Tayandanega, um, the Kanataki Seed Sanctuary. And our, 
their, their group is Radnianthos. And so this wampum, we have our replica of our wampum here to uh, represent our relationship to the seeds and our, our uh, willingness to care for them you know, for as long as, as we possibly can. And so they're growing out some of the seeds in Tayandanega. They've got a gorgeous garden there. Um, you know, if, if you ever get invitations to go, they have a seed to salsa event. It's probably past now, but it's, it's arranged in a circle. It's fabulous. I love what they're doing there. So we can see Kathy here. She was chair of Cassie at the time. Kate's in the middle. And then this is Janice Brandt from the Gunnataki Seed Sanctuary. So 2019. And um, it's so, so, so sorry. I should go back over here for taping. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you can tell I haven't done a, a live talk in so long. I'm so used to doing them on Zoom. This is, it's so interesting. Um, so anyways, this is 2021. This is Tanda Mambo, and he wrote a fabulous opinion piece um, that appeared as an opinion piece. It should have been front page news as far as I was concerned. So he's a farmer at the University of Calgary's Simon Fraser Farm Project. And I don't know if you remember, but in, the heat, in 2021, there was a heat dome over Calgary. Like, devastating, absolutely devastating. And um, so what they did was at this farm, they took like the same variety. So for example, maybe like black Valentine bean. I don't know why I'm choosing that one, but you know, they would, they would get like Mackenzie's, they would get Vessie's, they would get, you know, like all kinds of different national distributors. And then they also had locally saved seeds of, you know, the same variety. So black Valentine bean. And what they found, they didn't plan for this heat dome, let me tell you, but what they found was the potatoes, kale, and other plants from the seeds of national distributors succumbed to the heat and withered away. The same plants from the locally saved seed held on. So the importance of, like, at that point in time, our Cassie Living Seed Commons, we're growing them out in a very small space over at a community garden, Lakeside Community Garden in Kingston. And so at that point in time, I was really focused on the rare or hard to get varieties in our collection. This, it, it just like, oh man, it means we have to do everything. <laughs> you know? like, I mean, yay, we, we get to do everything. But it's just when you have, a, you know, uh, almost 200 varieties in your collection, it, it's just, it's a challenge, right? To grow them out in the time to keep the seeds viable. It is, it's, 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 it's a big challenge. So exciting the locally saved seed held on. And we're seeing that this year, a loving spoonful is kindly growing some of the varieties from the Cassie collection in their field um, at the community training farm. So it's fresh clay, hardly any amendments. The Cassie tomatoes are doing fine. They're not totally happy, but they haven't died yet. You know, and we're, they're producing enough fruit. We can get some seed off of them. So the seed, and in some ways, what we're doing in the community garden, I'm being a little too nice to them, you know, like it's nice soil, it's been amended. So they're, they're, they're toughening up out in the field. And what uh, my friends who do the, the Loving Spoonful Farm who are helping us, they said all of their field tomatoes died. So they still are getting tomatoes in their hoop houses, their covered greenhouses, but the ones that were growing in the field succumbed to disease and the Cassie ones have not and they're growing in like freshly turned over clay. So again, good news, you know, it is. It's really, and again, the importance of growing local seeds and diverse local seeds. So, yeah. This year it's been super wet, as we all know. We have a year in our field garden since we transplanted in the spring. We've had rain every week. Yeah. Of some sort or another, our tomatoes this year, there's no disease. Yahoo! Mm -hmm. Which is amazing to me. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's, it's, it's also what we're doing with the soil, but it's mm -hmm. also the seeds that we've been growing for a long yeah. time now. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you for sharing that story, Kath. And I, I also want to say that the orange Mennonite that I was, I was you know, promoting and so excited about. I actually got a large tomato from it uh, mid-July. 
which like to get a beef steak that was not a huge beef steak, but it was a reasonably size. The third week of July, like that was, and they weren't planted early. They weren't planted late, but I, I was I was pretty impressed because I was also doing a family vacation over in the county, and we our menu included a lot of big tomatoes, and we couldn't find any that same week over in the county. Like there were lots of little cherries, but there weren't any big ones yet. So of course I saved the seed from that and hopefully we'll push the orange Mennonite just that much further. So the other thing that is so interesting, I'll be uh, I'm aware of the time. So um, something else that we can do is we've got current varieties and what we wanna do is just as Kath is saying, like try and treat the soil and treat the seeds well and you know they'll they'll be more resilient. But there are ways that we can start going back to um, the increasing the genetic variation of the crops that we have available. And so I just want to do a shout out to Carol Deppi and Joseph Loftus. They are their their work. I brought um, Carol's book. I couldn't find Joseph. I think I lent it out to somebody. Um, so I brought her her work. Kathy kindly gifted it to me a few years ago, and it's just so inspiring. You can, if anybody growing can start breeding. Like she just, she's like, oh, okay, here, take a one by two strip of peas and you can create, you know. Uh, anyways, it's just amazing. So Joseph Loftus, just really quickly, he's, um, he, he trained as a, <laughs> he trained as a, a chemist, so he has a scientific background, and then he burnt out there, and he went back to the family farm in Utah, sixth generation family farm, and he loved musk melons, and they could not grow them there because it was too cold, too dry, the season was too short, and so what he did was he just got seeds from all the musk melons he could. You know, he would have gotten them from Carter's, I'm sure, from England if he could have. But what he did was he just sowed them in at his family farm on in the mountains in Utah. And he got two immature um, muskmelons, cantaloupe. And he took them inside, he ripened them up, saved the seeds, grew them. And from there, he's got a booming industry. Um, the, so he's a market gardener now, and he just this is he's doing this not just for musk melons, but also for tomatoes. Um, this is something I'd like to do with Cassie is get wild types of the tomatoes, and it will just increase their genetic variation. So this is one project, and the beans that we were passing around. I was giving a talk about him three years ago, and I went we need to do that with the cassie seeds. So I went out and I, I got 20 different varieties of dry beans and um, grew them out that year. And you can see how beautiful they are. Like I just, I love them. I have a little uh, two-year-old granddaughter. She will sit and play with those beans for, uh, I kid you not, like 45 minutes. I'm like, aren't you a little bored now? <laughs> you know I'm like, but it's the running their, her hands through them, pouring, you know, they're just, they're, and because they're living, living creatures, I, I just, I love them. So, so we're in year three of that. I started a fresh bean land race uh, last year. So we're in year two. We're just, uh, they're drying down right now. Um, and then I just wanted to, some of the seeds that you're very welcome to take home with you, I, I brought. So Caroline, it's a beautiful lettuce that the Mooks, Robert and Carol, the original, um, it was the heirloom seed sanctuary and um, that's what we call the heirloom seed sanctuary collection so they noticed this new type of lettuce and they just saved seeds from it and named it after carol so it's it's a lovely lettuce and these are some notes from kate from kate henderson uh, very nice i like it i like it as a head lettuce which i describe as a butterhead type because it's tender with loose heads so you can't get that anywhere else but from our collection and yeah, there's lots of lettuce in the world. They're growing it to send it to Mars. I'm like, I'm not a big lettuce fan, but this one, it, it's, it's lovely. It's, it's really lovely. And then another one, this is hot set tomato. Hot set because it actually sets blossoms um, over 30 degrees Celsius, supposedly. Um, most pollen, it is not fertile. At, that, at those temperatures, it just, you, you can't get, you, you just don't get pollination. And this is, again, one of the nicest tomatoes in our collection. It, uh, it grows up, it's mid-sized, 
um, but prolific and and with this it's going to be great for uh, as things heat heat up that's for sure something i should say i meant to mention it when i was talking about the mennonite orange and red again there's i didn't include this slide i'm so sorry there's a great book called uh, 10 tomatoes that changed the world it was available from the library. Unfortunately, it's not. I, was, I tried to sign it out to bring to this presentation, but we'll have to talk to Marjorie and get another copy in because it's great. Different chapters about why red tomatoes are preferred. And so the history of ketchup, the history of paste tomatoes, the politics, the, the competition, the, the money that's involved in these industries, it's just absolutely fascinating. And Barry Easterbrook's book about tomato land is, is also uh, really good, great reading. Um, and Astrid, what I've learned from Astrid is if you do taste testings, we've done lots of tomato taste testings. If you do them blindfolded, people prefer yellow and orange. They taste better. But if you've got the blindfold off, they're drawn to red. <laughs> and ironically, ironically, the orange ones, there's an organization in the States, after carrots, orange and yellow tomatoes have the most beta carotene, which is linked to improved eyesight. Uh, it, it metabolizes into vitamin A. Sorry, I'm a bit on overload here, but I, so I can't remember the, the, um, the metabolic pathway. But the more beta carotene you have, just like with carrots, the better it is for vision. And so this nonprofit is trying to develop more um, yellow and orange varieties with higher beta carotene to try and help with vision in the world. And so that's something I would like to start doing with the cassie tomatoes as well, really focus on, on those orange and yellow varieties. So how many mid-sized red tomatoes do you really need? Unless they can pollinate when it's above 30 degrees Celsius. So, um, and then this is Berta Rockencore. This is one that actually Kitchen Table Seed House carries. So we don't, we don't need to grow it out because they're growing it out, but it is part of the collection. So this burr, so buttery, so it's a butter bean. Um, so it moved from, beans moved from uh, the Americas over to Europe. France became quite a center for domesticating and improving vegetables. So Roquencourt is an area in France that's known for its high quality vegetables. So if you've got a bean, a buttery bean from Roquencourt, you've got the best. And I have to say, I've grown it out, it is amazing. It's a fabulous, fabulous bean. So very tasty. And even the seeds, I, <laughs> it's so prolific, I, it got ahead of me. So I saved them and cooked them up eating dry beans that have been grown the same year. Oh, the ones in the store, there's no expiry date for those beans. Ugh. It, so you start eating these fresh beans either one or two years after you've collected them, there's, there's no difference. Like the dips and oh my goodness. So another reason for locally saved beans. And then um, do you want to hear the story of Jacob's cattle bean? and turtle beans. So Jacob's cattle bean, have people heard of this one? Okay, so it's one that was grown in Maine. I love it because it looks like one that I adopted through Seeds of Diversity that's called the 1400 year cave bean. And so supposedly the bean that I adopted was found down in um, Arizona, I think, in a sealed clay pot and they were able to germinate it 1400 years later. I don't know, I think probably it was growing somewhere around the area, but whatever, it's still a cool story. And it looks just like Jacob's cattle bean. So Jacob's cattle bean, I think, has lots of um, variation in it as well. And it's just a really beautiful bean. Um, I can show it to you. It's probably in that collection there. And then black turtle beans, they didn't appear in the States until after the Mexican War when Americans brought them back up. People tried to market it, but because they're black, it turned like foods black and people didn't like it. And then they came up with this black turtle bean soup that was just the creme de la creme of whatever with cream in it. And so now all of a sudden it's fancy and, and everybody wants black turtle beans. So we grew them out two years ago. And what was really cool, we were working with a biologist um, at Queen's University, George Desenzo, and he came to look at the nitrogen, the, the nodules in the roots for nitrogen fixation. And he actually, we found three new species of um, bacteria 
area that fix nitrogen. So there's potential for the crops. And I think because it's such an old bean, that's why it was able to build relationships with these different bacteria in the soil. So that's why I'm doing a little shout out to the black turtle bean. Um, yeah, so what's next? We're just going to keep growing. We're a very small nonprofit, um, very small growing space. We rely on donations. We, uh, we do organize CD Saturday. If you save the date, second Saturday in March. First one was here on Wolf Island in 2008. Mm -hmm. Kathy organized. So it's growing much bigger. And uh, so second Saturday in March, these will be available. I'll also, I'm hoping we'll do a little uh, less formal one in November. So I'll pass that information along to you. It'll probably be in town, but um, hopefully we can get, get that information to you. And I think we just have to keep talking. We have to keep sharing. We have to keep growing and uh, loving these beautiful seeds. So just... Welcome to be a Cassie Seed Guardian. We're always looking for uh, donations, of course. Our CD Saturday is our, is our main um, fundraiser. And of course, we couldn't run it during the pandemic. So that was three years where we tried to do it online. It was with different degrees of success. And now what we're doing is we're sharing the proceeds with um, the Kanataki Seed Sanctuary in Tayandanega because we want to support their work as well. So that's, that's where... What we're what we're doing and how we're trying to keep things going. So, thank you so much for your attention and happy to take some questions. And if you go to our website, there's all kinds of like little graphics about how to save tomato seeds, how easy it is to save tomato seeds and bean seeds, and and you know seeds of diversity. That's our Canadian organization lots of information on their website and seed saver exchange have any in the for states Kathy? too so, yeah does anybody have any questions for Kathy? I have one so just okay. for clarification so hybrid seed <laughs> so you can't produce from that did i get mixed up yeah, there no no so with a hybrid seed what you can is yeah no no so with a hybrid seed what happens mendels. is the example very quickly that i gave so you was mendel's peas so a tall one and a short one so a hybrid could theoretically be in the middle if there's a gene for for height i'm not sure if there is or not um, but what happens is you save those seeds and just like um the mule is sterile, many of those seeds just won't be viable. Like they just won't actually grow. And the ones that do grow will likely grow either like the tall parent or the short parent. And so that's why if you really like that mid-sized or you know, that orange flower, that pink flower, whatever you're looking for, you have to buy the seeds. And so what the seed companies are doing is they are doing hand pollinations in order to make that happen. And one prop that I forgot to bring, and I for forgot to mention it during the talk, is seeds are so generous, or plants are so generous. One lettuce plant can make 30,000 seeds. So you think about these companies, you know, um, they're, they're doing the hand pollination, you get 30,000 seeds, and then you sell even 100 of them for, you know, $4.00 there's your, you planted one teeny tiny little seed and you've got 30,000 from them. And, and then, you know, the, the numbers decrease a little bit depending on, on the variety. But one year I saved, because I'm a geek, um, I saved the, the squash, the butternut squash from one plant. And so as I ate it and let it age, you know, they get sweeter as they age. Oh, that, it was so good. Um, so I saved all the seeds. There were 1,700 seeds from that one plant. And, and I know that number because I, I, I counted them. <laughs> yeah. And tomatoes, it's somewhere in between. Like the, the orange Mennonite, there's not very many seeds. But even so, on average, people think about like 200 seeds at least per, per um, plant, or sorry, per fruit. And then you think about how long, especially an indeterminate tomato variety grows. Um, yeah, so. And I also have to say, the early, you know, a lot of the varieties for open pollinated seeds, there was commercial interest in them too. So Alexander Livingston, he's like the, 
the parent of, of American tomatoes, like he was in it for the money. So he was trying to breed uh, tomatoes that would, you know, be transported. They, did, they weren't mechanically harvesting them at that point in time. But that's why the tomatoes that we get in the stores these days, they've been picked green, you know, thick skin, they, they need to be tough. And, and it's, they, there's no taste to them. And in that 10 tomatoes that changed the world, there's a chapter about how they actually grow them in Florida in plastic, in sand and chemicals. And, and those are the ones that show up in our burgers and our subs and our, you know, like the, our processed, our fast food. So even like to get them from the market, even if you can't grow them yourself, I just learned how to freeze them. Thank you, Astrid. A few years ago, I was making sauces like crazy in 2020. And, and then I said, Astrid, like, just cut them up, throw them in a bag and put them in the freezer. I'm like, of course. <laughs> so anyways, yeah, there's, there's good ways to keep our food nutritious. So thank you for that question. I'm sorry I went off. Oh, this happens. <laughs> Um, this may not be a fair question, but I'm just curious about this whole movement and food security. And like, is there a way of getting young people interested and involved, or is there much involvement? Like, I, I've heard the phrase food security for a long time. Um, I'm thinking about my daughter, and this, like, sorry, she just <laughs> she would not be interested in this at all. But I'm trying to think, what's your sense of like maybe locally of, of young people being involved and Maybe there's university and college programs that are getting them. Yeah, I, I think that there is. And, and I think we're also, we're moving away from the, the using the word food security is um, seen as kind of political these days. It's like having a, a, a strip of, you know, a strip mall where you can get all of the junk food you want, you know, so you've got this processed food, so you have enough calories to stay alive. That's like food security. Whereas food sovereignty is, I want my Mennonite orange tomato, and I want to have the seeds, and I can't rely on other companies to provide that to me. Or if they do, maybe it's a hybrid, so I have to keep buying the seeds every year, you know. So, so we're moving towards the idea of, and this is, I'm working a lot with Loving Spoonful to try and get seed system and food system inter like locked together. So we're talking not like intuitively we know when we're talking about food systems or food security or food sovereignty, seeds, we need seeds. You know, the, the quote is nine out of 10 bites of food start with seed. I think it's even more than that. But you know, it's, we need the seeds and we need to have that awareness. Um, we've just hired a uh, a recent high school graduate to work with us and that's so that's how we're trying to do it is to keep young people involved and um, and pay them equitably for for their work and and so hopefully she'll bring more people and I think my sense is like my three kids are in their 30s now and they're just now understanding that I'm not insane yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like they, they walked into, uh, they came to visit and they're like, where are your seeds? I went, I've got a garage now. I just moved. So I've got a garage now where I can dry the seeds. And, and, but my kitchen's still full of fermenting tomatoes right now, you know, and, and cucumbers and stuff. So I think it's, we keep talking about it, but not preaching, you know, and, and one of my best moments this summer was my son was eating a carrot and they're good eaters I should say my kids are very healthy eaters they, they really are and he bit into it and he's like I, I need to they've actually started shopping in the county they live in Belleville they drive to the county to get farm fresh stuff because the carrot he was eating didn't taste like a carrot and and so that's as I was just I was tasting tomatoes with one of our volunteers this week and we were biting into some of ours and and we we're like hmm tastes like a grocery store tomato and that was not a compliment you know so but it's still it's surviving and you know we'll we'll keep saving seeds from it but it might not be one that I offer at CD Saturday because I um, don't think it's that tasty so um, so those are those are just things we have to keep working on it's a great question the more we can get the youth involved absolutely and in Tayandanega they're doing a really good job of that they've got three interns they have money for three interns um, we're just scraping together some money to be able to pay this young person and yeah.
doing the best we can. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I, I guess my question is about Wolf Island agriculture, and I, I, I just moved here, so I'm just learning a little about the agriculture history. So, like, my property in 2010 was half corn and half soybeans, but across the road was pasture or hay field, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but now, like, our biggest three crops, like, used to be dairy and beef, and now it's corn, soybeans, and winter wheat, at least on the on the head of the uh, the head of the island. Um, I don't think anything's happening there with in terms of um, going back to uh, any um, uh, open pollinated. So I don't know how we're gonna face that. Yeah, I I agree. Change is hard. Change is super hard. So we used to save seeds, and then it became desirable to, like, I think of my dad and my neighbor, who my neighbor was lovely, and they would compete about whose tulips came up first in the spring. So, you know, when once you start relying on the catalogs and you think that my dad was a graduate from um, the Guelph in agricultural program, he didn't actually pursue that. He took it somewhere else, but it, he loved hybrids. He thought they were the bomb. So, you know, I think there's just, uh, that's why I spent maybe too much time in this presentation about monocultures. It's, it's the monoculture that's the problem more so than, um, well, I, I still, th I have problems with GMOs and because of the patents. You can't, it's not legal to save a seed from a patented um, variety. And so I have real problems with that. But in terms of going back and diversifying, there is a movement for that. Like I think we are seeing, you know, like what Kathy's doing on her farm. She's trying to convert, what, what, was, what was it before, Kath? Like hay? Soybean. Soybean. And so what they're doing is there's, um, you know, just different ways to improve the soil because as Astrid will tell you, if you even so much as ask, it's all about the soil. And I absolutely agree. And so what's happened with your property probably is the soil has changed so much that perhaps the only things that survive there are the soybeans and the corn. So now what do we have to do to amend the soil so that then we can start introducing other things in? And what I think history has shown, whether it's the potato famine or the starvation in Russia, is we have to diversify. And we have to do it quickly because of the climate crisis. So that's where getting young people in and getting all of us in. We have to all be on board and not take it personally. You know, like I was really hesitant about what to say about hybrids because of the agricultural, you know, systems that are here on Wolf Island. But I just decided to go with what I know. So, <laughs> so I'm hoping that, you know, just even trying a little bit something different and trying, you know, like in our, in our collection, we have an open pollinated soybean and we have a, a farmer, Chris Wooding, who grew it out for us a few years ago. He said it was like the most prolific soybean, like better than the hybrid, but we have to grow it isolated because where we grow at Lakeside, we're actually surrounded by the prison farms. And so if they're doing soybean, I can't grow it that year. Right. So because it will cross pollinate and, and I don't we don't want that. So it's cool. it's a challenge. It's a huge challenge. Right now. And if you read the farm papers, there's one page is organic, the next page is conventional, the next page mm -hmm. like, there's a lot of conversation happening right now. Mm -hmm. and it's it's a tough time to be in agriculture. <laughs> and and it probably always has been, but the problems right now are the problems right now are how are we how are we going to adapt to uh, depleted soils and Mm -hmm. Especially when you've spent all your money buying, you know, machinery so that you can farm in a certain way because that was what was promised to you or your father or your grandmother or, you know, whatever. It's, it's really, so farmers like Gabe Brown, um, if you want to Google Gabe Brown, like he's, he's a down to earth farmer and he just changed his practice and it totally inspiring at Cath. Like he's, uh, it, yeah, yeah. And and so we just need people like him. And change is hard. Humans like certain to do things certain ways. Um, the, a story that I just quickly 
beg your indulgence, there's a really good book called The Neanderthal Cafe that I, it came out about probably six years ago. And one of the chapters in it is the difference between how Neanderthals and, and Homo sapiens would handle the same problem. And uh, the problem was where to get the flint for napping the stone tools. And the Neanderthals would have just picked up and made do with something else. This is what the author, and you know, it's informed this, but uh, this story. Homo sapiens would walk back to the quarry 10 miles so they could get the perfect geode for napping that flint. And, and I see that with our species. I, I say it very respectfully and, you know, and, and lovingly, but that's just something we have to be aware of. We're, we're creatures of habit, and so it makes change that much harder. But that's a great book if you like human history, Neanderthal Cafe. It's available in the library, too. Um. Okay, so we're just about out of time. Is there yes. any like burning question that's left? Because we want to be able to have time so people can um, speak to uh, <laughs> 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 we want to wrap things up. Anybody yeah. wants to catch the next photos? It's going to be really not long. long. I just would like to know. If, I would just like to know if anyone here is saving seed that was that's been passed down through their family. Anybody? Do we? <laughs> yes. Are you? From grandparents? No, my mother. From your mom. Yeah. Thank you. Nice. So everybody needs to start, so then you can pass along. And, and my, like I said, watching my little grandbabies play with these beans is like one of the most heartwarming parts of being, and there are many heartwarming parts about being grandparent. Um, but this is, this, is, this is definitely one of them. So please peruse the, the collection. And um, we've got tomatoes. Some of the ones I talked about, some of the beans are here too. I brought them on purpose. So please, um, and take a look at... This is another amazing book. Seed Saver Exchange puts this out. Um, Oscar carries it, that novel idea usually. So I, it's, it's a good one. Um, and Carol Deppies as well. So thank you so much for listening to me. <laughs> thank you for the invitation. Yeah, okay, great.